You know, I think when this whole thing is over, you might be witnessing one of the most horrible crimes, perhaps, in a century. John Wayne Gacy, and it was kind of the John Wayne Gacy everybody knew. You know, everybody in the neighborhood knew John Gacy. I mean, people just gravitated towards Gacy. I mean, this guy was very well liked, well respected. He was a affable, likable, um, helpful kind of guy. Everybody, everybody knew him that way. He was very well known politically. I mean, his parties that he would have in the summertime were a who's who of Chicago. He was a clown, he was a precinct captain, he was helpful to people in the community. As far as everybody knew, he was a productive member of the community, and uh, nobody would have suspected anything uh, irregular or wrong about him at the time. Scariest thing about him. He felt he was invincible, um, and that was his downfall, too. On December 11th, 1978, the man everybody thought they knew started to expose shades of a monster, a rapid unraveling, and it began with a fateful meeting with a 15-year-old boy. On September 8th, the storm, now a hurricane, hit Galveston, and the result was devastating. Winds of up to 140 miles an hour destroyed thousands of homes and buildings, and the water and high winds wiped out roads, and down power lines. Within only a few hours, it's estimated anywhere from 8,000 to 12,000 people were killed. The storm would have been terrible today, but in 1900, it was an incredible catastrophe because predicting hurricanes was an inexact science at that time. The Great Galveston Hurricane of 1900 occurred in an era before wireless communications before satellite recon, even before aircraft reconnaissance that really didn't start until 1944. But back in the vicinity of 1900, the late 19th century, the only way you knew these storms were there is if some wayward uh, mariner had run across these things in the course of their travels. They'd come to port and they would get on a telegraph and wire in their encounter and it report the storm's existence. I looked at my mother and I told her she was in the wrong line and they took her into a different line. That's the last I saw of her. When I asked several hours later when I would see my mother, they showed me the smoke. And so the thoughts are, would she have lived if she had stayed with me in my line or would she not? Did I send her into a line that went directly to the gas chambers. So these are memories all of us live with. Memories of a place that was a living hell, Auschwitz. In May 1940, Rudolf Haas, the SS leader of the Sachsenhausen prison camp in Germany, was appointed commander of Auschwitz. He brought along 30 German inmates to perform basic tasks. Then. On June 14, 1940, the Nazis deported 728 Polish prisoners, most of them with the resistance, from the city of Tarnow to the Auschwitz concentration camp. And its history began as soon as those first prisoners arrived. The main idea, Cyrus Avery was put in charge of this project of being able to connect all these paved pieces and make it all one continuous. The the concept was, uh, was new for its time. This patchwork of roads would become known as Route 66. Five days of torturing record heat combined with power outages left many people with no way to escape. I remember uh, that Saturday getting a call from our assignment desk at the station saying, do you realize uh, how out of hand this situation has gotten? We have a coroner calling in refrigerator trucks to store the bodies, and uh, there is, uh, there, there's a number of fatalities, the likes of which we've never seen before in a heat disaster, and for which we have the sense that we're not very well prepared as a city. But no one could predict the tragedy that was about to unfold 
in Chicago. Despite the warnings of what was to come, many Chicagoans carried on with business as usual. 